This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Christopher Cruden. He's a repeat guest. He came on about 10 years ago, a trend-following trader who specializes in the currencies and gold, a really down-to-earth, pragmatic sage, a guy who knows what's up, who's seen a little bit of everything, somebody who you will enjoy listening to. Without any further delay from me, let's jump right into my conversation today with Christopher Cruden. I hope you enjoy. You were saying about podcasting, as I said, I generally have not done the video stuff. You see that it's like, hey, most people just don't, they listen. That's right. A lot of people, myself included, don't have time to sit and watch a podcast where basically you're looking at a talking head. It's more of a radio thing. You've got it on the background and you're attuned well enough to pick up the interesting points. I don't think it's constructive use of most people's time to sit and watch yet another television screen. The audio version is just perfect. Yeah, and I do a little producing, and I've told people this recently. I just kind of explained how I do things. I'll take out pause words. Any of us, you, me, whoever, has a bunch of pause words or something. I would say this, though. Generally, I used to have to, maybe 10 years ago or eight years ago, maybe somebody would give a whole paragraph of something that said nothing. I would cut that. But generally these days, I would have to say, most people are pretty tight that I talk to. Now, maybe I'm self-selecting. Maybe I'm picking people that can talk. Yeah, could be. <laughs> Today may be the exception. <laughs> <laughs> Since last time I talked to you, you were living up there in the mountains somewhere in Switzerland in some kind of compound. I don't know if it was really a compound, but you were living somewhere up in the mountains in Switzerland, and now you are back to the home country, correct? That's right. We lived in Switzerland for 12 years. We came back to the UK. We went from the sublime to the ridiculous. We lived just off the King's Road in Chelsea for two years, and then we moved up to Scotland. Scotland is my home country. We live about 20 miles south of Edinburgh, way out in the countryside in a very old house. That's where we've been for the last five years or more. Are you enjoying that contrast to me? I'm currently in the middle of a very large Asian city, and it's pretty much chaos. How are you liking that type of getaway? I love it. I'm not the perhaps most social person. At least that's what my dear wife of 36 years tells me. So I can't be that unpleasant. But nevertheless, I like to be alone and remote in certain ways. And because we've stepped or have stepped back into the business after a couple of years, we may be changing our current arrangement. But at the moment, especially during COVID, living as we do and where we do, it's been absolutely perfect for us. If you were there, then you really didn't feel too much of COVID. No, I feel a bit of guilt about it, actually, because as I say, it's a very old house. It's surrounded by nine foot walls of a three foot thick 17th century house. We saw and did nothing during COVID. You look at the, watch the television news as you do, and you see the suffering that some people are going through living in tower blocks, other close confined type accommodations, and your heart bleeds for them. You think, my God, we are so lucky to have been here. Very, very lucky. I was just back in the States for the month of September, and I had a chance to go to both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson's homes, which I had not seen since I was a kid. Jefferson's in particular, I've not been to Scotland. I lived in London many moons ago. I have a sneaky suspicion there's some similarities, very hilly and remote. Jefferson's home was a really nice getaway. It made me uh, really respect somebody all that time ago, having that great isolated depot up on top of a mountain. It was amazing to go see. Yeah. Getting away from it all is a blessing if you have that ability. First, since we talk a little social stuff. But let me first get you to, since we spoke last, give me your best philosophical take on where trend following is today, just overall, before we even get into 
how you see trend following, how you apply it, your way of doing it. But how do you see something like trend following today and maybe even contrast it to, I don't know, the first time I found out about it, early 90s. It seems like to me that the acceptance is probably about the same niche. Am I far off? I would think personally that it's greater than it was. But like so many things in business and society, because we hate to be or to give the appearance of being old fashioned, we tend to rename things. Trend following has now become systematic, for example, in a smaller sense. I've never met a trader of any kind in any market who wasn't systematic in what he did or what he does. The words trend following have now become widely accepted systematic. And I don't know anybody who's a sit in the chair, seat of the pants trader in the way that they used to be. The size of money is too big and that sort of thing. There's all sorts of reasons why that's not possible. Compliance and regulation being another one of them. The trend following, I think, is probably bigger and more accepted than it was. I think that managed futures and CTAs, which are almost by definition, mostly trend following systematic traders, I see them having a bit of a renaissance. Does that mean that from your perspective, in terms of the actual, if you're kind of renaming many in the industry, we're talking generalizations here a little bit, if you're renaming many in the industry as having a, a systematic or a trend following approach, but they are probably not, even if they've gone systematic, have they become all price-based traders? Have they ditched the fundamentals, so to speak? Well, I think so. If systematic or trend following has gone up, it's because people are now much more familiar and comfortable. Indeed, some of them insist upon a quant-based approach. Years and years and years ago, back in the early days at AHL, I don't even think the term quant had been invented. It certainly wasn't in common usage. But when people did hear the word quant, there was a certain amount of trepidation to that. Now they're much more familiar with it. And as I say, some people absolutely positively insist upon a quant approach. Quant approaches generally are systematic approaches slash, in one way or another, trend following. So what's happened to the fundamentals? Have people just given up on it? So it's a combination of the landscape out there are the typical buy and hold type mutual funds or just index funds. And then you've got, let's say in the CTA universe, you've got your Again, whether you call it quant, systematic, trend following, CTA, momentum. Is that the landscape? Of course, you're going to have the high frequency stuff, the people that have got trading at the speed of light. I don't really know if that's even trading or what that is. Is that the landscape? I think it is. I think that fundamentals are very interesting cocktail party conversation. But is that how you actually do something? And I think more and more the answer to that is absolutely no. Everybody's got a view on what Jerome Powell is going to be doing or not doing. Everybody's got a view on all sorts of things. But does it actually affect the way that you trade? For us, the answer is no, and indeed it never has. And I suspect that that is becoming more the case for others as well. People buy the sizzle, not the steak. So you've got to have a story. And one of the issues we've always had as a firm is that we don't offer any market views at all because we're not predictive in any sense, which doesn't make us terribly interesting to cocktail parties, which is why I tend not to go to many. You're not leaving that castle in Scotland. That's right. <laughs> You're well spotted, Michael. <laughs> right now, if I look at, and I try to be always something that's evergreen on this podcast. If I bring up an example, it's just an example. I really don't care what's going on right now, but it's interesting if you were to discuss the fundamentals right now, and the fundamentals are, Inflation's disappearing. There's going to be a rate cut. It's going to be a soft landing. And it's like all of a sudden, like if people were like really paying attention to what the quote fundamentals are, it's just some kind of form of messaging. You have to decide how do you believe in the messaging? That'd be the question I have for the fundamentalist. How do you believe in the messaging? Whereas, and I want you to contrast these, whereas in your world, you don't have to believe in the messaging. That's absolutely correct. When I started in this business, I started when I left the army in 1979. As a gold analyst, back then we had, um, was it Howard Ruff and gold hit in January 80, 850 or something like that. And then it dropped to 225 a couple of years later. That was driven by fundamentals to a large extent. 
another word you could use is shorter is, is hype. Nowadays, if you look at the price of gold, given the state of the world, you would assume wrongly that gold should be much, much higher. I understand the fundamentals. I understand what you're saying. But the fact is, it just plain isn't. And I think that's become the problem with fundamentals. Each and every one is a more interesting story. But in this business, we keep track in dollars. It's a very simple and straightforward business. We've got black numbers, red numbers, plus signs, minus signs. It's not hard. And you can't dress that up with a story without having a look at the price. And what you discover from the price, which is the reality, is that the story is flawed or just plain wrong. I mean, for a guy like you, and we're going to get into this, who's trading gold, trading currencies from a trend following perspective, map it out. Okay, take the position of a fundamentalist and take the position of a fundamentalist who needs to appease investors who want a systematic approach. Explain to me how that's done. It's hard because the nature of the marketing of fund products, like all marketing in almost every product, is pitched at an emotional level. The investment world has, since its birth, I would imagine, tried to convince the investor, the potential investor, that there is somebody who has some knowledge, some predictive power, some insight, some intuition, some special feeling. I personally am a big seller of that. I don't know anybody who can predict the future. But you've met a lot of people. You've run in some interesting uh, capitals over there in Europe. You've not met them yet, and you've been in the business for a while. I meet people who, on a random basis, they've got a 50-50 chance of being right in a way, haven't they? Actually, that's an interesting point. If you look at the trading strategy, our trading strategy, which is, I'm sure, very similar to others, is a very mild advantage on a win-loss basis, a very mild advantage of something like 59-41% on a win-loss basis, which you would think is not high, but what it does tell you is almost very closely tossing a coin, buy or sell, would almost do just as well. But the question there is, is what do you do once you're in a trade or coming out of a trade for that matter? If you and I wanted to sit down and invent the world's greatest trading system, which I'm sure we'll do after this podcast, we would aim for something like a 50-50 win-loss ratio with a three-to-one payout. And if we could come up with that, we would quite literally, within a short period of time, have all the money in the world. I don't mean a lot of money. I mean all the money in the world. 50-50 win-loss with a three-to-one payout. Now, our system is, in essence, a 50-50 win-loss with a payout of $1.20 to a dollar. So it's 1.2 to 1, which is good enough to have done what the strategy has done. And that is without having any fundamental input whatsoever. Our system, for example, produces two to three times the rate of return of gold, partly because it can be short as well, beats ETFs, obviously, which underperform gold, and beats gold equities and gold funds. If you look at those three things, the ETFs, the gold equities, and the gold funds, the more management you layer on, the worse performance you get. And one assumes that management of these things is based to a large extent on fundamentals, whereas a system such as ours is not based on fundamentals at all. It's an odd world, but that's all I can say is that's the way it is. I mean, that's the edge that you've designed. That's the edge that you've found. Some people might be saying, well, I want to hear about something else or more of an edge or this or that. Life doesn't work that way. Sometimes you just find your way into an edge, you find your way into a strategy, you find your way into an audience, and hey, you maximize it to the best of your ability. Yeah. And that's almost the disadvantage of trend following. Because as I said, we keep scoring numbers and dollars. There's a limit to how much you can dress it up. It is what it is. I was just making a note here too, just to take it back to the fundamental analysis. I've seen this recently. And it's very strange to me. It's the first time I've said this on the podcast. Maybe I've hinted at it, but I've noticed now that people are using the two letters. So they're either calling it FA or TA, which I didn't pay attention to. So maybe it's been happening for a long time, whatever I didn't pay attention to. It's now ubiquitous at the retail and the professional level. I'm seeing it everywhere. And someone texted me or it was on Twitter or X, whatever. They said something about FA or TA and I 
men to know what they're talking about. Do they know what they're talking about? What are they talking about exactly? Someone says, well, I use FA, I use TA. What the hell does that mean? It can mean anything. What fundamentals are you using exactly? And how are you using them? If you say TA, you say technical analysis, generally you're not talking about trend following. Now you're in the realm of YouTube, squiggly lines on the charts. And if this candle happens here, that means this price is going to go here. Completely outside of the world that I've written about or that you've worked in. Yeah. This industry just gobbles up buzzwords and jargon, doesn't it? Right, right. We just gobble it up. It struck me, though, because it's like, wow, like the people that are using it, it's like they're adopting something that they think is legitimate. They don't even have the power to figure out or the insight to figure out it's not legitimate. It's just very strange to me. You know, it's like, what does this mean? That is absolutely spot on. Getting back to the analyst thing, I mean, having started off as a very young gold analyst many decades ago, an analysis of the usefulness or the investability of gold analysts' predictions, they are, of course, of no use. The question is, well, why do firms have a gold analyst? The only thing I can come up with is because clients, prospective investing clients, expect to see one. And so they have one. Now, are they investable in what they say? It's not what our analysis said at all, but you've got to have one. Does the client that expects a gold analyst, do you think deep down that client really actually expects to make money in anything? If your understanding of the basics are not deep and you're just going by the buzzwords and the jargon and what might be on the tube, if that's what's driving you, it seems like deep down the people that expect these things that want the gold analyst aren't really expecting to make money deep down. They're gambling. Well, some of them are gambling. But if what analysts say, generally say, is that gold will go up, then that would indicate what you've got to do is just buy and hold. Most of them don't seem to realize, or many of the investors don't seem to realize, that gold is a commodity and a currency. And as a commodity, it also goes down. What that means is you should retain the ability to be short. Most investors, I don't know what the percentage is, I bet you it's more than 99% of all invested money is invested on the long side. And all we do is we sit around all day and say, gosh, what, it's gone down. Yeah, but you left yourself no capability to get short. So you lost money. That's the beauty of derivatives or currency crosses or futures, options, that sort of thing. But most clients, most investors to this day are not particularly familiar with the ability to go short. The other thing that makes them lose money is poor liquidity. First started off, this, when I got back to the States in 82-ish, 81, the first thing I was taught, we taught seven things actually, but I've forgotten the last four. But the first three were to make something investable, it must have liquidity, transparency, and market integrity. Now, if you look at those three criteria, and they're must-haves, they're first and foremost on the list, they are absolute must-haves. If you insist upon those, then there's a whole bunch of stuff you needn't worry about because it doesn't pass the test. And that's very useful because it enables you to focus. Focus is a very important part of making money. The word that's coming to my mind right now in this conversation is trust. If I'm listening and I'm new, I'm thinking, well, you know, that guy, Chris, he sounds trustable. Now I'm going to go verify him. I'm going to look through all of his information like I did, and I'm going to verify, and I'm going to see how long he's been doing this and check out his track record, check out his logic, et cetera, et cetera. The part about the gold analyst is that the trust part, you're the XYZ retail investor out there or whoever, we're going to put this trust lens on Chris. Where does the trust lens go on the other stuff, the stuff that's so hypey? And it might be more than gambling. It might be something else they're going for. But it just strikes me as how people, and this could apply to a lot more than investing in the modern world, is this lack of trusting but verifying, meaning like, okay, I'll take Chris at face value, but I'm going to verify him. Or I'm going to take this issue or this other person, I'll trust them for a second, but I'm going to verify them. Where the hell's the verification gone? I really don't know. I think people build a persona 
both a personal persona and also a corporate persona. Whether or not the persona is justified or justifiable, in my view, in many cases, is highly suspect. Just because the guy in front of you puts down a big business card with a blue chip investment bank on the top of it and all sorts of scrambled egg letters qualifications below his name, what does that actually mean? I think because of the proliferation of terribly, terribly clever people in our business, it's become to mean less and less because we expect everybody to be an MBA minimum or a PhD, that's nice, or go to Oxford, Cambridge, or MIT, or something like that. But those are the minimum. But that still doesn't necessarily mean that they know what they're doing. The only thing that can indicate that is an extensive track record in a variety of both bull and bear markets in their specialism. Many of them simply don't have one, in my view. You brought up the three-letter things that go after your name. I guess I have one of these. I'm not really sure why I have an MBA. I was thinking about the PhD part of it. I've had a lot of PhDs in this podcast over the years. I'm sure they're all bright in some measure. But I find, and I don't think this has changed, you're right there in the headspace. The traders, specifically the trend-following traders, for whatever reason, and audience, please correct me if I'm wrong, sound like the most down-to-earth logical thinkers driven by science. Whereas sometimes I'll get the PhDs on this podcast. The issue might not be trading, it might be something else, but it starts to become messaging. It's not about the evidence. If I have someone on this podcast and they've got a particular message they want to talk about, maybe they don't know exactly how I'm going to press them. They learn pretty quickly, I'm going to press and search for the truth. But I noticed they don't like that. I've never really found across the traders that I've had on this podcast, no one really minds to be pressed because it's kind of like, okay, here's Chris and here's what he does. It's on paper. So there's a certain confidence, whereas sometimes I find the PhDs, maybe deep down, they really don't have confidence because they really don't want to be scrutinized. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I would cast my mind back to late 80s and much of the 90s. In other words, before the advent of so-called hedge funds came in. In those days, the allocators, and certainly in the US where I was, were all FCMs. When you went in to see one of these, and there were other allocators spread around Chicago, New York, roundabout, when you went in to see one, and I don't mean to be unkind here, but you could see a big fat guy with a McFluff flurry on his desk and a half-eaten Big Mac. In the corner of his office, out of the corner of your eye, you would detect that hanging up, there was a multicolored, brightly colored floor trader's jacket. When you sat down to talk to him, he knew what you did because he'd done it. He's running a portfolio of 10, 20 CTAs. He knew what his total exposure was on any one particular market. He knew what his exposure for each and every CTA was. These were decisive people because they came from a trading background. You can't prevaricate in trading. It is open, close, that sort of thing. Those sort of people don't exist anymore, of course. Now we're replaced by a monthly committee. And the monthly committee is, I'm quite sure, a bit of a brain trust. They're not as reactive and therefore not as successful as we used to be in this business. And I'm talking here specifically about CTA business. It's an odd thing that, in my mind... One of the best trades you could have made over the last 23 years or so, if you'd have gone long the number of PhDs and short industry returns, you'd have made a fortune. <laughs> you wonder, I mean, I wonder too, is you think about what you're describing, the, the migration from the guy with the McFlurry and the Big Mac in Chicago. Half eaten Big Mac. Right, yeah, who's a street smart guy, essentially. Yeah. A trader pit guy. And if you go from that guy to what you might imagine is the room full, the committee of PhDs, you wonder, we can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow, but you wonder about the risk buildup when you have 
radically different types of individuals with radically different types of experience running the machine than the types of people that would have been running the machine decades ago. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We used to have a word for those types of people that sort of have the managed futures allocators, you call them MABs. They had the money, the authority, and the balls. You meet people these days, and they don't really have the money because it's not their decision. And they certainly don't have the authority. It's certainly not their decision. And you know what? Push comes to shove, they don't have the balls either. For an alternative industry, I think, in my mind, I would classify that as being a sad decline. Do you think enough people do the exercise of just, some might think this is a prediction. It's not a prediction. It's the exercise of imagining the impossible, which could very well be possible. I don't think people do that enough. Now, if the impossible happens, you're an absolute return guy. If gold craters, if XYZ currencies expand or contract or whatever, you're ready. Your strategy from the ground up and you can correct me if I'm wrong, your strategy from the ground up is prepared for something like that. But I think most people don't think about the impossible being possible, and they don't have a strategy prepared for it. I think that's totally true. At the outset, in my view, all strategies should be bi-directional, because guess what? Markets go up, and here's the exciting bit, markets can also go down. I personally don't mind if gold goes to $500 an ounce or $5,000 an ounce. That's going to cause some people, I mean, not traders, but that's going to cause a significant portion of the population to immediately think, I mean, I can't even get in their shoes anymore. It's so foreign to me. If you say 500 or 5,000, like, okay, it's like built into my DNA. I know what you mean. I think for some people, they might be thinking, well, that guy sounds a little wacky. That doesn't sound normal. Why could he be so motivated by that? The reason, if you talk about investors' perception, I think investors have been sort of hogwash in some way to think and believe that the markets will go up. Certainly when you're dealing with a commodity, you can argue whether currency is a commodity. Arguing against a gold being a commodity is slightly more difficult. The fact of the matter is these markets go up, they go down, they go sideways. That's what they do. You have to be prepared to make money from all of those eventualities not just one, sitting around gormlessly looking at a screen, hoping it's going to turn green. That's not going to work because that's not what markets do. It's specifically at this particular time, without getting into any fundamental prediction, pundits seem to be saying that we might have rough times ahead, in which case you certainly need to be um, bi-directional. In the early 90s, I think was the first time I read and it might have been John Henry's shop at the time, somebody was talking about how they had gone back and looked at price data for hundreds of years to basically test their strategies going back over time. I remember going to this place, I think it was in Beltsville, Maryland, the National Agricultural Research Library. Somehow or another, I talked my rear end into getting access to stacks, essentially library stacks, in some walled off area. I'm not sure how the hell I got in there. I remember seeing a newspaper the day after, just sitting there, a newspaper that was an actual newspaper the day after Lincoln was shot. So this was the access that I had. And I remember going through the old economist attempting to do some of this, to look at price data. And I think, so when you make the point about up, down, or sideways, people really need to understand that's back to the dawn of time. And it will be into the future as well. It's not gonna change. That part of human nature is not going to change. Whether you go back and you try to find price data 500 years ago, or you somehow or another figure up some AI to uh, project price data into the future, what you just said, attempting to capitalize on the up, down, or sideways, this is it. It's always going to be it. I agree. I mean, people like me or people who are in the investment world, whether they care to admit it or not, are not in control of price direction. We might like to take credit for it occasionally, but the fact of the matter is gold or equities are going to go up or they're going to go down or they're going to go no place. That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen whether or not BlackRock says it's going to happen or Goldman Sachs says it's not going to happen. That's what markets do. And it seems to me that without being bi-directional and without being biased in any one particular direction, that's an absolute requirement. It's a prerequisite for positioning yourself to profit from trading markets. 
I thought that's what we were here for. You sleep better that way too, don't you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, let's be frank. That's a big part of this. People might think, well, that sounds silly. What is he talking about sleeping better? Come on, give me a break. We all got to sleep. We're still human. We got to sleep. We got to eat. We got to go to the bathroom, whatever. I mean, sleeping is an important thing. If you are stressed out of your mind with an incomplete understanding of the markets or a strategy, the stress is eating at you. I mean, you could shave years off your life really fast. Absolutely. This is another thing I'd mention you well brought up there. One of the ways you can cause yourself sleepless nights and kill yourself is excessive use of leverage. I mean, our strategy is limited. It cannot go more than two to one leverage. But most people say, well, that's really wimpy for a gold slash currency um, a strategy. My guess is I had no way of proving this, but I would say excessive leverage has killed more people than the average size war. The best way to stay alive is not to put yourself out of business slash kill yourself with excessive leverage. And just because somebody will give you leverage doesn't necessarily mean you have to be silly enough to use it. Now, people have to understand, too, that when you say you're at two to one, that means you have done your level headed best to see how things would shake out if you were three to one, four to one, five to one, 10 to one. You've done all that homework, and there's a reason you're at two to one. It's not just because, like you said, a wimpy or something. I mean, there's a concrete reason why you're two to one. Absolutely. Some people want to go bungee jumping and not check the, the ropes tied onto the tower. If you add the leverage to these things and step out over the edge, it's not a good thing to do. Well, it's one of those things, they always talk about the difference between uh, mortality for men and women. Well, it's like, well, if you took the significant numbers of young men who do crazy ass, you know what, out of the death thing, maybe us guys would not be so far behind women. Maybe not. Maybe not. Leverage is an important one. Bidirectionality, I mean, to me, absolute prerequisites. Don't go near a market without them. How did you make the shift to where you're saying, you know what, we see trend following, we see systematic strategies in the gold world, in the currencies world. We'll let other people tackle other markets. Why did you start to go down that path, that fixation on those particular groups of markets? The guideline for me is liquidity. Got to have the highest level of liquidity that you can possibly get. I said it, I used to do the speeches a lot many years ago. I don't do them anymore. But I said at one of these conferences, your liquidity is like your wife. You don't miss her till she's gone. And that is very true. Very, very true. People think they have liquidity. They think it's sufficient liquidity, but they often find out that it isn't. And that can be very, very expensive. The scariest word in this business is no bids. Now, if you look at gold and if you look at currencies, these are incredibly deep and liquid markets, far more deep than equity markets probably second to treasuries, but they're certainly up at the absolute top according to BIS numbers. That sort of, as I said earlier, limits you to what you should be looking at because with diminished liquidity, you're looking at a different kind of risk. It becomes more and more an unknown kind of risk, whereas if you've got maximum liquidity, as we think we have in what we trade, then we have always the ability to find the exit Whereas some equity markets, so-called emerging equity markets, emerging currencies, these sorts of things, they're different. They're absolutely different to what we do. And clients should know that that's the case. They are, in fact, very different things. I'm thinking of trust again, and I want to use just a somewhat silly example. It's not silly in a, in a way, different type of example. So I'm thinking of the many people out there, and this is happening in America. It's probably happening around the world. People are, uh, or have been, maybe not so much now with the rise in rates, but they've uh, attempted to gobble up extra houses or extra apartments, and then they become uh, Airbnb uh, rental masters, and they are the new hotels. You think about it, well, where's the liquidity on something like that if you need to get out of something like that? They've got to trust the system, essentially. They've got to trust the system is going to keep their asset prices propped up because there really isn't any liquidity there. I mean, if you need to get out fast, you're in trouble. Whereas you, with the strategy that you've built, people can like or not like the strategy that you've built. From a trust standpoint, you've got to trust the price. 
you try to get the best liquidity you can in the markets that you've selected, as you point out, you do, but you don't have to really trust anybody. So if the Fed is doing X, Y, Z, whatever, saying whatever, or some fund blows up or whatever, you're ready. You don't have to trust the Airbnb apartment master. That's right. And with liquidity goes the word immediacy. We fully accept within foreign exchange slash currency crosses with gold that the last print represents the sum total of the world's knowledge. It's all there. In the equity world, the analysts will try and tell you that there is something else there that they've seen. Therefore, the company should be bought or sold. In FX, we are happy to accept because of the nature of the markets, the size of the markets, the participants in the markets are enormous. The last print is the um, sum total of the world's knowledge. That is a great relief to have that comfort. There's very little that can be hidden in the price of a major currency. It's pretty much all there. Emerging currencies, maybe not so much, but whatever, they're still better than equity markets. Whereas a lot of the equity market and fixed income market to a lesser extent, verbiage revolves around knowing something that somebody else doesn't. You could, I mean, if you so desire, but you have found a space that you like to operate. I mean, of course, people apply systematic trend following approaches to other markets beyond currencies and gold. Sure. People often ask, why could you do the same thing with oil? And the answer is, yeah, but we would lose the liquidity to a large extent. Could we do it with the S&P 500? The answer is, yeah, but we would lose the liquidity. That's just the approach that you've built, the niche that you figured out where you want to operate. Yeah. I want to ask, though, when you say the last print, sum total of the world's knowledge on one of these major currencies, what percentage of people, and by the way, I should go back and get a transcript of your conversation. I can already tell you've said several things that would be those nuggets that I would put in the side margin of one of my books. You've got a very good way of that. The last print, sum total of the world's knowledge, let's say, you know, Swiss franc, US dollar. What percentage of the population do you think knows what you mean when you say that? I mean, we're just guessing here. We're just spitballing. But general public, 10%, 5% know what you mean? I would say 5%. Yeah. There's a lot of smart people in that 95% that don't know. I mean, there's high IQs, doctors, attorneys, engineers, but it's just not something in their purview. What about in the industry, so to speak? Currencies or trading currencies is probably something that a lot of people are not terribly familiar with. Some of those who are familiar with it are terrified of it. And the reason that may be is because they previously had a bad experience. But that bad experience, in my view, would in the main have been caused by excessive use of leverage. Currencies themselves are not inherently volatile. There's only less volatile than equity markets by a long, long way. Now, if you want to goose them up with leverage, fine, but that's your problem. It's not inherently uh, the fault of currencies themselves. To the point, the last print, sum total of the world's knowledge in the industry. I'll give you an example. The reason I keep asking this, years ago, I gave a presentation in front of the Market Technicians Association, 600 people in New York City. I asked for a show of hands after I had given an hour-long presentation on trend following, what percentage of the audience understood what trend following was as I had just explained it for the last hour? Maybe 10% of the hands. So 90% of the quote market technicians association did not know what trend following was. Now, look, I'm sure some of them are listening. I'm probably going to get hate mail. Maybe they're burning me in effigy. I'm saying something bad. I just care about the truth. That's just what the hell happened. Back to my point with you is if you are truly talking to industry people and you say, hey, the the last prince, the sum total of the world's knowledge. Where do you think? We say 5% general public. What about the industry people? It can't be that much higher. Do you think it's that much higher? I think what I said about retail people would apply to the industry as well, to a lesser extent, obviously, but still apply. Because they too believe that there must be some hidden knowledge, some secret source out there. I personally don't believe that. If you look at our system and other systems that are like our system, Kintor doesn't know that it's looking at gold prices. He doesn't see gold in Swiss francs, he doesn't see gold in Japanese yen or Australian dollars. It just sees a row of numbers. What we actually trade is seven rows of numbers. And they have different volatilities, different correlations to each other and all sorts of things. 
but that's all the computer sees. Well, for some allocators, they like to think there's something more to it than that. One of the reasons for that is they are undoubtedly clever people, but you don't really have to be that clever in my view, perhaps I shouldn't just saying, don't put this in your books, but you don't really have to be that clever. You just have to be disciplined and have a small statistical edge. That's what we got. There is a lot of money to be made off people's belief in the crystal ball. A lot of money to be made in the belief that there is some extra piece of information out there. If you're some big fund that's got a built-in user base, some big brokerage firm or whatnot, I mean, it's gift money. It's gift money that people believe in things that don't really have a solid foundation or don't really have evidence. I guess if people want to give up their hard-earned cash to be part of the, I don't, I don't want to say casino, but it's essentially a casino, I guess that's just the way it works. It is the way the, the industry works. It used to say, I don't say it anymore, but it used to say that we don't use chicken bones, tea leaves, or crystal balls. That's not what we do. You need steel balls for what we do. <laughs> and we reduce that by being low leverage. There's no comment I can make on the price because the price is the reality, whether I like it or not. <laughs> I'm going to guess the answer is liquidity. But of course, in the last decade, we've had a new type of currency that's come onto the scene. It's gotten a lot of interest. It's had a lot of ups and down moves. Has this thing reached the scale or the liquidity that you would want to use it with your strategies? And that would be Bitcoin. I'll mention the three things I mentioned before, liquidity, transparency, and market integrity. And then there's a long pause. I don't see Bitcoin or any of these currencies coming or meeting the criteria as we define them. It's nowhere close, nowhere close. Bitcoin seems to me, if you have to say, what is the investment theory of Bitcoin investment? I would say the theory is known as the greater fool theory. Okay, but we're talking price today. So if it's up and down and there's enough liquidity, okay, maybe the liquidity, as you just said, is not enough for you. But ultimately, and I guess I don't know how you would define market integrity with Bitcoin. I mean, to me, I don't see a purpose for it. To me, it looks like, I said this the other day with someone, to me, it seems like it's just become a way for people to bet. They can just bet on nothing. <laughs> but I mean, betting on nothing does produce a series of prices. Absolutely. Then the issue becomes, though, if one gets involved in something that perhaps doesn't have the liquidity... And you're like, hey, this is rock and roll, man. I'm I'm up huge. But then one day, if Bitcoin is 90% whales that control this thing, maybe it's just an organized pump and dump. If there's not really transparency there, if you really don't know what's going on, plenty of people have gotten uber rich. Some people have won the lottery too. It comes down to that type of thinking, right? Absolutely. And speaking of lotteries, I mean, I always think to myself and say to people, you know, if your next door neighbor won the lottery, would you sell your house, empty your savings account and sell your car and give him all your money on the basis that he's good at buying lottery tickets? And the answer is no to that question, I would think and hope. But people seem to do that all the time. And the most popular way to do it at the moment seems to be Bitcoin or some of the other uh, so-called cryptocurrencies. I reposted something today from this guy, Morgan Housel, who wrote this really popular psychology book right now. I think it's called The Psychology of Money. The post he put on X was, quote, the most important financial skill is having no FOMO, no fear of missing out. <laughs> I suppose that's probably true. Right. I mean, it's essentially what you just said. You got to have your approach. You got to know what you're doing. You got to know who you are. And, and that's all you get. Maybe you'll get lucky and maybe you'll invent some product. You become the next Zuckerberg or Bezos, but the odds of that are not very high. They're not strong, no. No, no. There are ways, there are ways on the margins. You can't really set out to make a billion dollars in life, but you can set out to do a hell of a lot better than the masses. If you find yourself into your world, for example, 
even if they never invest with you, it's just like listening to your philosophy, listening to how you map things out. Again, it just goes back to my point that I said earlier on this podcast is that traders just sound real. I sometimes enjoy my podcasts with other guests. The difference between the two is off the charts. Yeah. A lot of being a trader is to stay in business, to stay alive. And the best way to do that, as I mentioned, regardless of the leverage aspect, is to avoid losses wherever possible. If you've got a set of rules, which is what a system is, then that makes that a lot easier because you're not married to a trade. It's just a trade. That's all it is, whether it's a winning trade or a losing trade. Many people, I think, become emotionally involved. Two things that are really unhelpful in this business. One is emotion and the other is ego. I just don't know that people don't attribute their success in a stock market, for example, or a Bitcoin to their own genius. I am sort of a seller of that. I get that you did well because you're in the right place at the right time, but the opposite of that can happen too. And what is your risk management for that? What is your stay alive proposal? If you lose 10% of your money, you've got to make 11.11 to get flat. If you lose 25% of your money, you've got to make 33 and a third percent to get flat. If you lose 50% of your money, you've got to double your money to get flat. That's called volatility drag. What I'm really saying is that making back lost money is harder than making new money because you need more to make back lost money. You need bigger gains to make back lost money. I want to share one little nugget from your one of your most recent corporate write-ups. It's a summation. By the way, I saw a picture of her recently in her 20s before she became famous for the bleached blonde hair and very, very buxom. I saw a picture of Dolly Parton in her 20s that I had never seen before. That woman, this is probably a 1970s picture, was beautiful, unbelievable, just like this most natural, just beauty, unbelievable, so much better than where she went eventually. But I was like, wow. Anyways, to calm myself down, the Dolly Parton quote that you quote, quote, the way I see it, if you want the rainbow, you got to put up with the rain, end quote. People can go check you out, Chris, and they can come see your firm. They can check out your performance. They can catch up with you. You've got a lot of information on your website, really cool stuff. You go in depth. Today, I just want to have the conversation because you are that kind of guy that you've got great wisdom. I think sometimes that's half the battle here is letting people have a nice conversation or listen to a nice conversation with somebody that they might not get a chance to meet. I do appreciate you coming on and sharing, and we'll definitely have to catch up more. I know it's our second time on my podcast, but I really enjoy the conversation. I have to. I really enjoyed it to speak freely, which has been a great pleasure for me, especially ending up with a quote from Dolly Parton, have, have, <laughs> have a better ending. Your firm name had a slight adjustment, but why don't you speak to that and let people know the full firm name and where they can go to find you? I recently partnered with a firm called Cross Border Capital Limited, a London-based hedge fund. They've been in business since 1996. They manage about $1.3 billion in the main for UK pension funds. They are also very, very well known in the exclusive end of research. And funny enough, their big topic is global liquidity. Isn't that a surprise? They're great people. And dare I say they are of my um, age and background to some extent. It's worked really, really well. Where can people go find you in the firm? Go to crossbordercapital.com or inchkintore.com, I-N-S-C-H-K-I-N-T-O-R-E.com, inchkintore. They can check out some of the info that I've seen. Like again, a, a deep dive. I've not tried to take you through all the research and everything. I just want to have the nice conversation and you gave that. We'll leave it with Dolly. Here's to Dolly. Here's to Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email 
michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.